So let's start it. Um, welcome to today's webinar, um, whatever it takes, making our building EV friendly in the context of the EPPD. So um, some announcements to make before we really start. Um, the webinar is recorded. Um, all participants can receive a link after the event with the recordings. We have a QA and a in place. Uh, please use the Q&A box for posting your questions. Questions you can upvote with your thumbs, and we try to limit the questions also in time wise. So feel free um, to post there where you find necessary. Um, we have, of course, our panelists or speakers from today. Their views expressed during this webinar do not necessarily represent the views or policies of Avere or its individual members. So they speak on behalf of their own organization. Short word about Avere. Um, Avere is the European Association for Electro Mobility. We have, um, of course, a quite good member representation, even beyond um, the map that you see over here. We have mainly um, members that are representing the industry or EV users. And on the industry side, they are split out in two main pillars. One on the vehicle side, the classical OEMs or suppliers of those, and on the other side, the infrastructure. A good reflection board we always have with EV users on board, and that's also our aim, make immobility e happening in favor of the end user. Um, today um, is the first event in the context of our STEAM events. Um, yeah, STEAM, it sounds strange context for many of you. It was also to trigger your attention. My team is indeed the link to science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And this brings us back actually to the beginning of uh, the organization start in 78. Um, it was scientifically based. And on to introduce on the full understanding of this scheme event, I'm going to share with you our STEAM video. If the computer wants to do it, of course. Here we go. And this brings me immediately to our panelists of today. Um, I'm giving the words to Rafael Elio, is our policy officer and responsible for the EPVD within Navere. Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today to discuss the EPVD um, and whatever it takes to make our buildings EV friendly. Uh, EPVD is a request which we very much welcome at Avere. Of course, buildings are where the majority of charging happens for electric vehicles, and therefore they remain the backbone of a smooth rollout of electric vehicles in the coming year. Um, the Commission proposal has been uh, to some extent, well, it has to some extent matched the ambition that we are pushing at Avere, but some MEPs within the European Parliament have even pushed for uh, further ambition, notably on topics like the inclusion of heavy duty vehicles, uh, charging infrastructure, extending the scope to existing building and proposing guidelines for fire safety, to just name a few. Uh, those will be topics that we'll be trying to tackle today with uh, our uh, guests. And so I'm pleased to be joined by three experts in the field from different associations. I'll introduce them one by one and give them the floor for about, let's say, three minutes 
can uh, give you a bit more if needed, uh, so that they can present their association, of course, but also comment on the PPD proposal, the debates that we've seen in the European Parliament, and uh, then we'll be able to uh, follow a quick video from Mr. Schieder, uh, who is the opinion rapporteurs on the EPBD in the Committee for Transport. But without further ado, I'll first introduce uh, Eugenio Pintieri, who is the Managing Director at Fire Safe Europe. So Eugenio, the floor is yours. Rafael, thank you very much for uh, inviting us. My name is Eugenio Pintieri. I'm the Managing Director of Fire Safe Europe. Fire Safe Europe is the organization representing companies and professional organizations aiming to improve fire safety uh, in, uh, in buildings. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, DPVD is a crucial piece of legislation because of uh, uh, the many implications that we will have, uh, that will have on the decarbonization of the built environment. Um, our opinion is that uh, um, we fully support uh, all measures that aim to decarbonize the building environment. At the same time, we need to make sure that uh, fire safety is guaranteed. And this is especially important when we have a look at uh, the electrification measures uh, that are uh, uh, very good uh, for the environment, but at the same time, they create new and uh, diverse uh, risks that need to be assessed. And I think uh, our role uh, as an industry and our role also in cooperation with Avere and other stakeholders is to make sure that uh, we can uh, um, guarantee the deployment of uh, electromobility in, in the case of that we're discussing today of electric vehicles, but at the same time that we do it uh, in a fire safe way. Uh, and on this, uh, we have uh, made different proposals and that uh, I we will have the possibility to discuss uh, uh, later on. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, Eugenio. Indeed, some questions will come on fire safety later. Um, a big topic which uh, hasn't really been debated uh, so far, so uh, we're quite happy to have you here today to discuss it. Um, up next is our next speaker, Michelangelo Avetta from uh, Euroelectric, his advisor for electromobility and energy efficiency. Michelangelo, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Can you hear me and see me? Uh, we can hear you. Can't see you. Or maybe it's just me. OK, I here I am. I have just appeared. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. So Michelangelo Aveta here. I am the um, advisor on immobility and energy efficiency at uh, Aeroelectric. We are the Electricity Industry Association. Uh, based in Brussels, and we represent and speak for more than uh, 3,500 um, electricity companies that are ranging from the distribution, the generation, and the supply of electricity all across uh, all across Europe. Um, buildings are definitely a cornerstone of our of our activity. There is a, a lot to do when it comes to their decarbonization and more specifically with regards to their um, electrification. As you were mentioning as well, um, Rafael, uh, buildings and I would say even more um, residential buildings are and will remain, we believe, the backbone of the charging infrastructure and of charging the operations in Europe for the years to, to come. Hence, a strong energy performance of building directive and a strong set of uh, provisions with regards to smart or sustainable mobility is of paramount importance. Uh, we've seen that the introduction of a single and comprehensive article on this theme uh, is a very positive step in the right uh, direction. It supports perhaps accelerate a swift transition to zero emission mobility in, uh, in Europe. Um, we've also seen some other positive elements related to uh, a stronger, even if somehow timidly, but stronger right to plug uh, uh, principle in all, in all buildings and trying as much as possible to hit those regulatory or even administrative barriers that are in many cases hampering or maybe disappointing some of the citizens that would like to switch to sustainable mobility. Uh, the overall um, system of buildings is changing 
as you might be hearing also in my background, somebody is renovating their apartment right now. So this is very much a work in progress, but uh, let's keep it at this and I'll intervene with more points in the, in the, in the next hour that we have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Michelangelo. Again, right to plug is also going to be a big uh, topic for our debate today. So uh, looking forward to your contribution on this. Lastly, and I think you will also have points to mention on the right to plug, Robin Luce from Buke, uh, who is a sustainable transport officer. Uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everyone. I think you have to activate my camera as well, because I can't do it by myself, it seems. But in any case, I'll start and I surely will surely see my face in, in a second. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robin Loos. I'm the Sustainable Transport Officer for BEUC. BEUC stands for the French Bureau Européen des Unions de Consommateurs. Um, so we represent consumers across Europe. We are strong of a 46 member network. Um, and as I said, I'm responsible for everything that is related to mobility. For the last few years, uh, and, and since the beginning, we looked at mobility at BEUC uh, in terms of costs. Um, with development ongoing, we looked also at the sustainability side. And I'm not going through the whole research we did for the last uh, two to three years, but the compromise between costs and sustainability seems to be electric vehicles. It is quite clear that in terms of uh, savings for consumers, we achieve great, uh, great savings for them. And on the sustainable side, it is true that uh, electric vehicles are more sustainable than conventional engines. Um, now that we know that, we need, and that's probably the, the strength of BEUC network, is to make it easy and convenient for people to be able to drive these, vehicle, these vehicles, but also to charge them. And here we have two pieces of legislation to make that happen. The first one being AFIR, which is uh, focusing on, 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 on public charging. And the topic of today, EPBD, is also very important uh, because, and I think I'll, I'll be able to mention it later on, but it's probably the cost effective option for deploying enough chargers across Europe in residential and in non residential building. Because let's be clear the, um, the transition to e mobility won't happen overnight and it won't happen if the right framework is not set in place. And that's what we're calling here at Berk to make this charging network user friendly. That means for public chargers that it should be able, that should be easy to charge, to pay, to understand what it means. But when it comes to private and semi-private charging, it also means that it should be easy to install one, to have a permitting process, to convince your landlord or your co-owners to install one. All the measures that should be made transparent, easy, and let's say less costly than it is now for consumers to be able to, to have a whole EV experience as it should be. So these are the, the couple of points I would like to, to touch upon today, and I'll be happy to discuss uh, with my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, indeed, great tandem between AFIR and EPBD and uh, good uh, discussion upcoming on uh, the measures that, that should be transparent, but also, also uh, affordable for people to install chargers at their homes. So great discussion coming. Um, as I said, we have uh, a pre-recorded video from Andreas Schieder, opening rapporteur of the EPBD in the Committee on Transport, who couldn't join us today, unfortunately. Um, but in the video, he shares his views on the EPBD, uh, and uh, he points as well uh, uh, where the discussion should go uh, in the European Parliament. So I suggest we take a look at it, and then we go back to the panel to discuss some of the points he raises. Dear colleagues, I'm very sorry that I cannot participate in the webinar due to other commitments. Nevertheless, let me thank the European Association for Electromobility for organizing this very important event. And if I can't be there, I'd like to say a few words to you. The revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, shortly EPBD, is part of the Fit for 55 legislative package to achieve the goals of the European Green Deal. The revision of this guideline aims to make renovations of buildings such as apartments, hospitals, offices or schools easier and more energy efficient. And as we know, most of the energy consumption in Europe comes from buildings. Therefore, Increasing their energy efficiency would reduce greenhouse gas emissions while tackling also energy poverty 
and counteracting high consumer energy bills. The revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive will modernize the existing legal framework to meet ambitious targets and urgent climate and social needs. At the same time, however, the Member States should be given the necessary flexibility to take account of the differences in the building stock within Europe. The aim is to achieve an emission-free and fully decarbonized building stock by 2050. Therefore, the renovation rate must be increased and the more targeted financing of investments in the building sector must be facilitated. However, tools to support consumers should not be missing either. E-mobility and the provision of charging uh, infrastructure also play a very important role there. Strengthening the regulations for smart and bi-directional charging can contribute to the building energy system integration and grid balancing. At the same time, the expansion of electromobility will lead to a decarbonization of transport. As the rapporteur of the European Parliament for the Trunk Committee on this particular topic, I was quite ambitious with my draft. My main calls are the significantly increase of proposed targets for charging points in new non-residential buildings and non-residential building undergoing renovations. At least one charging station for every two parking spaces. And to increase the charging points in existing non-residential buildings with more than 10 parking spaces to ensure that rapid, comprehensive and continuous process in the building the necessary charging points and infrastructure. The determination of additional targets for pre-cabling of parking lots in existing residential and non-residential building. So, let's sum it up. We are proposing progressive increased targets for recharging points for new residential and non-residential building as well as for pre-cabling in existing residential and non-residential building. The promotion of smart and bi-directional charging plays here a crucial role. Our aim is better reflect the expected growing market share of electric vehicles and to meet also the charging needs of electric vehicle drivers. We also need to strengthen the right to plug, meaning to facilitate and accelerate the development of charging infrastructure for private individuals. We have to remove barriers, improve technical assistance and have shorter deadlines for installing charging points. Furthermore, we need more and secure bicycle parking spaces, but also use parking spaces in its best possible way. We have to create incentives to install solar panels on large parking lots to generate energy. We believe that buildings must become smart and flexible energy assets to achieve a more integrated and efficient energy system. I wish you an interesting exchange and thank you again for the organization and for the invitation. All the best. Thank you to Mr. Schieder for this uh, intervention and uh, for the interesting point that he brought to the table. I think there are several topics mentioned uh, in this video that our panel will be keen to discuss. Um, I'm, I mean, thinking of uh, the strengthening of the ambition for pre-cabling in new renovated but also existing buildings, strong right to plug, uh, shorter deadlines when it comes to installation of charging points, but also uh, an increased use of V2G. So without further ado, let's move to our panel discussion uh, with the first question addressed to everyone. So Mr. Schieder mentioned that he wants to be ambitious when it comes to pre-cabling uh, for, for existing buildings. So that's a step further than the European Commission uh, position that we see as very positive within Avery, considering that more than 70% of charging happens at home or the office, and that 2035 seems to be the end date of the sales of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Therefore, my question to you, uh, should all existing buildings be included to ensure the smooth rollout uh, of EVs? Is there anybody who wants to go first? Otherwise, I'll pick one of you, Michelangelo. Yeah, here I am. I sensed, I sensed that I was uh, someone for this uh, 
for this question. No, um, look, Rafael, I think that the um, the issue here, as as usual, is a matter of uh, is a matter of uh, making it possible and making it uh, pragmatic, right? Um, if we're talking about uh, the charging infrastructure, is uh, it is difficult to to consider charging points and charging options for the consumers without the right installations. So without the pre-cabling requirements existing in the in the buildings. Um, now we have had the we have had the lengthy discussions. Allow me also to give you a little bit of, um, of insight also on our uh, internal debates and discussions on these points related to uh, the need or not for um, for a mandate for the pre-cabling requirements for the existing for the existing buildings, the idea that all the buildings should be um, pre-cabled in uh, in one go is definitely something that uh, we believe should be uh, left out. Nonetheless, a gradual equipment of buildings of the pre-cabling is definitely. Um, is definitely positive, and it's something that we could uh, that we could support. Now, there is also an issue, perhaps, and I don't know whether the others have any um, concern on on this one. There's also an issue related to what precisely is uh, defined as uh, as pre-cabling. Uh, we want to effectively guarantee the installation of charging points whenever they are needed. So whenever they are asked by the citizens. And this should be clearly defined uh, when it comes to the uh, technical cabling, but also the technical pre-equipment in the installations that are present uh, in, the common, in the common areas of, uh, of building. There are still many countries in Europe, in fact, I believe there should be the majority where the common areas uh, and their electrical consumption is all built in one single uh, under one single user. So complexities and difficulties exist also on the on the administrative side. However, more ambition on the pre-cabling is definitely something that we could favor. Of course, this is something that needs to be done in the respect of the highest standards of uh, fire safety. <laughs> Thank you, Michelangelo. Indeed, a proper definition is definitely needed. Uh, what we're seeing as well in uh, other countries is that uh, it's often pre-ducting rather than pre-cabling, so having a proper definition is uh, quite important here. Is there any reaction to this problem, maybe? If I may, then I'll, I'll jump in, um, because it's also something Michelangelo mentioned in his opening statement. Um, it is true that if we focus on residential building, um, we target quite consumers where they live. Um, I would argue, though, that um, the cost-efficient way to go is probably to focus now on non-residential buildings that have the capacity to welcome consumers where they go shopping, they do their sports, their leisure activities. Um, there you have a great uh, opportunity to install charge points that would be used by several consumers. So you would have a cost-effective installation of these charge points. And the installation itself, um, the cost of the installation, would be borne by um, companies, supermarkets, sports centers, leisure centers. So in one go, you send a signal to consumers that, look, there is or there are charging points next to the place you live where you do your daily activity. And if you spend one hour grocery shopping, two hours in sports, if you do that once a week, well, your needs, your weekly needs of, of, of electricity for electric cars are covered. Um, you also tell them, look, the investment is made for you and you probably will not need to wait for an installer to come to your place. You will probably not have to take care of all the administrative issues at your place because the, the service is right there. And I think overall, um, and that's also a signal for, for, for private companies and then, as I said, supermarkets and other, it will become a commercial argument saying, I have a charge point at my place. Um, so that's also one of the points we, we, we mentioned as book and that's part of our amendment proposals. Um, the cost-effective way should be targeted there. 
Now, of course, does that mean that all buildings should be pre-cabled everywhere at the same time? I agree with Michelangelo, that would make no sense. Uh, but sending the right signal is important. There was today a report from our member, which, uh, which is the consumer organization in the UK, so not anymore in the EU, but same philosophy, um, that mentioned that for, for many people, and 40% of EV drivers, current EV driver, would estimate that the nearest public charging points is at more than a 20-minute walk. So it, it is a bit of a deterrent at the moment, if you see just a plain number. Of course, when you have an EV, you adapt for the moment. But knowing that there is one is already a great step to break down these barriers to entry for people. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Definitely interesting. Of course, uh, the commercial argument is indeed a good one. Um, although residential buildings at some point will, do, will have to follow, of course. Um, you mentioned the cost of it, and I think it brings me to a, to a question that I wanted to ask you. And, then I'll jump back to you, Eugenio, because I also want your opinion on this. But uh, who should pay for the installation of pre-cabling uh, in residential buildings, in your opinion? If we're talking residential building, of course, the cost should be firstly borne by, by the owners or in an agreement by co-owners association. But that brings me to an important point that I wanted to make uh, when coming to this debate. Um, when we're talking about and the price of electric cars today, they're already getting more expensive as old cars are getting more expensive. So it's not a problem about electric cars, but cars are getting expensive. And so knowing that you would have to make an extra investment can be also a deterrent for people to say, oh, I might think twice. Um, and that's where I think public authorities have a role to play in, again, breaking down these upfront costs of the car, but also of the charge points. There are new financial means that should be set in place for people um, and that's also a topic of uh, of one of my colleagues paper on, on you know financial financing the transition for people and what the, what she says filling the investment gap making able for people to pay as they when you know, reimburse as they pay as they as they earn the credit having these revolving funds for not having to bring up the upfront cost straight but being able to reimburse on several installments green loans guaranteed by the states or subsidized loans by the states. Those are all the ways that should help people saying, okay, listen, you, we were gonna help you financially and you will see the benefits coming your way in the years to come. But of course, the, when it comes to residential building, you decide to install a charger point, it's your own responsibility. If you manage to have this agreement with all co-owners, that will bring down the cost, but still the financial help for, should come there uh, from, from, from member states and, and local and regional authorities. Nice, therefore quite in line indeed with uh, what uh, Mr. Shido was saying as well, creating incentives to uh, support the consumers there. Definitely something interesting. Uh, Eugenio, sorry, getting back to you, should all existing buildings be included to ensure the smooth rollout uh, of EVs in your opinion? We do not have a strong opinion on this, of course, because it's not our core business, but I can maybe give uh, maybe some points of attention. I think uh, uh, I hear the different sides and uh, where uh, what should be prioritized when it comes to pre-cabling. Pre and I, I think we need to pay when whatever the decision is. And uh, I think we need to give, uh, uh, in a way, uh, priority uh, to standards uh, in terms of fire safety, especially when we have sensitive buildings, you know, uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the most, I would say, risky uh, buildings, which are uh, high rise buildings, or when we talk about schools, when we talk about hospitals, I think there we need to pay uh, a special um, attention. And then when it comes to uh, the residential part, I was here. I was hearing what uh, Robin uh, was um, uh, suggesting in order on who should bear the cost of, uh, of these measures. I think in Europe, uh, you have uh, uh, different systems in which you could have uh, green loans or even uh, uh, local or regional subsidies uh, for this kind of activities. I, but I think there, what is also important is, I mean, I think what we are seeing today, I'm sorry to, to make another point, I think what we are seeing today when it comes to the different uh, um, uh, 
sustainable solutions. Uh, in Europe, we see two trends also as a follow up of the renovation wave. One, we have subsidies of, or loans or spe special financial schemes, but we also have uh, technical assistance to citizens that want to implement such sustainable measures. And you see it, for example, with the creation of one stop shops and the development of many one stop shops. We have a fantastic one here in Brussels, so that I'm very familiar with. And I think uh, when uh, we talk about precabling of uh, these uh, residential buildings and this possibility in terms of financial and technical assistance, we also need to reserve uh, uh, an attention in terms of money or technical assistance uh, related to uh, fire safety. And this means, uh, first of all, having a look at what is possible through the different subsidy schemes or financial schemes uh, in terms of uh, uh, support also for for example, the electrical safety uh, of the recharging points, but also the training that uh, um, one-stop shops and uh, the competence that one-stop shops can have within themselves and can offer to citizens that want to go for pre in uh, in their buildings. So I think it's something that we also need to have a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, I think it's uh, also something that not many people uh, know about. It. There's a lot of... Uh, misunderstanding about fire safety. So maybe a question still for you, Eugenio, but what are the fire related risks of uh, EVs and their recharging points? Uh, could you just give us a bit of insight on this? Yeah, I think the first uh, issue when it comes to uh, fires and recharging points comes already on where the recharging points are located. And given the fact that uh, in most of the cases, uh, especially when we talk about future measures, this will be in enclosed spaces. Uh, there are many risks that are associated to enclosed spaces and fires. That this concerns, uh, as a general point, both uh, electrical vehicles, but also uh, more conventional vehicles. And uh, first, uh, this comes from the fact that uh, uh, there is a good chance that uh, the fire will spread to other vehicles. Uh, another big problem is the toxic smoke that uh, derives from fire that is the the, the 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 thing that kills people and and that's and, and the problem is that in an enclosed space it's difficult to extract uh, the smoke and the the other important issue is that when you have a fire the structure of the building may be uh, damaged by the heat that is uh, provoked by the fires and uh, and given uh, the the location of the enclosed space the problem is that it's difficult to extinguish them. Then there are also uh, specific uh, risks that are associated to the electric vehicles. And there is the fact that it's difficult to put the battery uh, fires out, that sometimes you need uh, uh, chemical agents, the, uh, the fire can start again after many hours. Uh, when you go with water or an immersion container, it is difficult to put it in a uh, in a small parking. So also the intervention there uh, is difficult. So I think we need to rethink and uh, uh, how we design and select the parking infrastructures and EV charging charging points to ensure and prevent to, to ensure the safety of the citizens and prevent also damage to property and the building itself. Thank you. Thank you, quite interesting indeed. A uh, lot of uh, challenges, but I'm sure that there's a way to, I mean, to actually tackle those challenges. So are there um, what well, guidelines that we could, uh, well, best practices that the EU could learn from at the national level or even in third countries? I know Robin mentioned the UK earlier, so maybe they do have uh, some uh, guidelines over there, best practices. And do you see a need for harmonization of EU regulation when it comes to that? Uh, I think, at the moment, uh, we are at, uh, I would say, uh, at an early stage in Europe uh, when it comes to uh, this technology. It's This is a new technology, I mean, old new technology, but you know how it is with uh, regulation. It always comes later compared to the technologies that are uh, in, in place. So I think we are far from having a, an harmonization of uh, uh, national regulation. I think, uh, to be honest with you, um, at, the, at the level of the European Union, uh, we as the fire safety industry, but also the EV industry, we have a role to play, first of all, to um, 
have some bottom-up initiatives in which uh, we describe a bit what are the, 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 the main recommendations when it comes to the fire safety of uh, EV recharging points and, and electric uh, vehicles. And there's a, for me, it's also a call to all uh, stakeholders that are interested to uh, cooperate on this. I think at a certain point, uh, we will also see some top-down approach. I mean, this also depends on what will happen with EPBD. Uh, we are seeing that, uh, I mean, maybe at a certain point, we will have uh, EPBD implementation guidelines related to the aspect of our safety. If this will depend also on the final text, but this we will discuss later on. Uh, but there are also really good recommendations uh, coming uh, from uh, um, stakeholders and uh, regulators. I can uh, quote a few. We have uh, FITS, the Forum for, a, for a European Electric Domestic Safety, um, that advise, for example, to uh, check the wall electrical installation before going uh, for uh, uh, the recharging points to make sure that everything is taken into account. Uh, we also have good recommendations uh, uh, in the UK, uh, because in the UK they are quite advanced also in terms of fire safety, and this comes from the insurance, but also from the Fire Protection Association, when it comes to uh, fire risk assessment, fire safety management, when it comes you know, to the electrical uh, provisions. I will stop there, and then if you want, I can go more into detail later on if you want to know about what are the recommendations. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. I think uh, you said it like a bottom-up approach and a cooperation between stakeholders will be key here. Um, EPBT can play a role, of course. Um, we are already pushing for guidelines to be included on fire safety within the EPBD, but um, definitely the cooperation between associations is going to be the, the cornerstone. And uh, to respond to your call, I'm very, very interested uh, to, to join this. So uh, thank you for this. Um, I guess moving to uh, another topic, which was mentioned by uh, Mr. Sheeter, <laughs> sorry, uh, the right to plug and the removal of administrative barriers. Uh, in his draft, Mr. Sheeter suggested a delay of maximum three months for the installation of a charging point once requested. That, of course, raises feasibility questions. And so I turn to Robin from Buke with a consumer perspective. Uh, what does an effective right to plug look like for EV users? Um, how do we ensure? synergies between the right to plug and co-property codes in national member states? Yeah, it's, it's an important question. I think there are four main keys to make right to plug a, an actual success. That would be information first, information to consumers. That would be easiness of the procedures, as, as mentioned. That would be reliability, and I explained a bit what I mean by that. And most importantly, maybe, that would be the comprehensiveness of the right to plug. When it comes to information first, um, e-mobility, and, and we need to realize that, it, it's a new world for many consumers, and you cannot expect them to be fully aware of all the technical details of a car, of a charging point, and therefore they don't know, and they don't have to know exactly what the needs are for them. Do they need a wall box? Do they need a smart meter? Those are all the questions they need to answer, and for that, they need reliable information. And this reliable information should be provided by, by the authorities. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that because there's a funny story about, about it actually in, in France. But they need information when they buy a car, when they want to install a plug. Because, you know, sometimes, and I discussed financial support uh, before, but it could be as simple as that when you want to reduce the cost. Having the right wall box or maybe just a reinforced plug if they need, just need that. So all the information that people would need that would also help them bring down the cost and have not have this uh, oversized wall box that they they someone would 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 sell them. And for that, there's a simple solution. We mentioned it: national one-stop shop shop. Sorry, for legal guidance, for for processes, also for financial support. So that's the information part. On the easiness part, I think there's quite a striking examples with more and more companies developing themselves on the business model that is based on. We will take care of all the administrative hurdles and all the problems for you. We will do that for you. Of course, you will pay for the service. Is that really the solution or not maybe the highlight of the big problem it is? For the moment, it's complicated uh, in many countries to have the permit, to have the agreements of co-owners, to go through all the administrative steps. And so instead of letting a business develop itself on the fact that it's complicated, uh, let's bring down all these barriers 
uh, easy, e the easiness of the, um, uh, the permitting process, you have to smooth it up, really. That's the second point. The reli reliability for, uh, point is also, for me, super important. Um, once you have that information and you know the process will be smooth, who do you trust? Um, can you have access to certified installers of charge points? Um, how do you know one is tr trustworthy and not the other? And in that, I think member states have a great role to play in establishing these training and certification programs because A, we need to trust them, but we also need them. There's a clear lack in, in many countries of, of trustworthy installers. Um, so that the reliability part is important. And the last point for the right to plug to actually work is that it's comprehensive. And in there, we need to focus on tenants, on people that don't own the parking space they're, they're using or don't own the flat they're, they're living in. And there we need to set up right, the right schemes uh, for, that, for tenants to be able to request or install a charge point at their, at their place of location, share the burden and benefits of a charge point uh, between the, the landlord and the, and the, and the tenant. Um, I have in mind the example of our director general. She's uh, for the moment renting uh, her house and she managed to convince her landlord to install solar panels, solar panels and she would increase her rent a bit but she would see her energy bill decrease at the same time. So it's a win-win situation. And those are, you know, this is one example, but this could be institutionalized in a sense so that this, this kind of solutions uh, happen. So these four key pieces of, 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 of information, easiness, reliability, comprehensiveness. But again, and then going back to my favorite point of the day is, is financial support. Uh, and this is where we should target it. And I think... That's also a question that we have today with the energy crisis. We need to help people face the high prices of fuel, of petrol and diesel. But the mindset of public authorities should be, let's make sure the right investment, the green investments are easy to people. And let's send that signal with, as I said, revolving funds, green loans, subsidies, that the right investment for consumers in the medium and long term is the green investment electric car, but also renovating your house. That's also something that we should focus on much more. Um, so I think the right to plug is a nice concept. The EPBD can really set the framework, but a lot lies in the hand of, of, of member states, of course. Definitely, always with directives. So uh, always the issue. But um, you, you've mentioned earlier, and uh, I think it's also linked with the right to plug incentives you've made a link between AFIR and EPBD. And so I was wondering whether um, within your conception of right to plug, you were considering um, people that have that live in buildings but don't have necessarily access to a garage. Um, should we have a link with AFIR in here so to make sure that there is a public charging infrastructure developed near the house if they don't have the capacity to, to have one at their own house? Clearly, um, that's linked to my previous comment uh, after Michelangelo. First, we need to install the charge points where people do their daily activities to send the right signals. That does, that's the first thing that EPBD and AFIR can do, both together with the right requirements. Um, of course, AFIR can, can really dig a bit, a bit deeper in the, pro, in the, in the, the problem, um, but both directives and regulations can, can act there. Another solution is, of course, to allow owners and tenants and that could be PBD. That's one of the amendments we, we introduced, we, we proposed at least, is to request the installation of a public charger if you don't have the possibility to install a private charge point. Uh, there are good examples in Amsterdam, here in Brussels, where you can request that. Um, and I think that's a good step forward because some people might simply not have a garage or it's physically impossible to, to, uh, to charge your car at home. Um, but that means local authorities should be involved, of course, uh, that's a requirement so that they can plan ahead and they can develop exactly where the, 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 the charge points are needed. And that goes back again to what I said, if you want a cost, cost effective deployment, this is also a, a, a quite nice tool. You know where you have to put chargers and you bring the demand where people, the, uh, the supply where, where people uh, want it. Um, and one thing and one very important complementary point between EPBD and AFIR. I think it's Article 5 of AFIR, which requires, which has several requirements about user friendliness of charge points. 
And I think this can, work, this can work both ways, because if you don't have your private charger, you will have to use the public one. But you need to be able to use it, to pay for it in an easy manner, to make sure it's available, to make, to make, to make sure it's, it's well maintained. It's also a massive problem the consumer sees on the spot. Um, taking back my example from the UK, more than 60% of EV drivers have already faced a dysfunctioning charge point while needing to charge. It's a lot. It's enormous. So AFIR can really complement EP EPBD in that sense to make sure the public charging network is, 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 is perfectly functionable and, and, and user-friendly. Thank you for that. Um, Michelangelo, I see that you want to comment. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot to to unpack, and this is definitely the sign of a of a vibrant um, exchange, and also the interest that many actors have on sustainable mobility and in general all things related to energy now more than more than ever. If you if you think of it, so there's a, a series of series of reactions. I would I would start with the, with the last one. Uh, Robin was um, I think rightly pointing to the need for somehow stronger links between um, AFIR and uh, EPBD, shall we say public infrastructure and pub private infrastructure. I do see that there is um, some space for improvement when it comes to these relationships, perhaps via the I don't know, better reporting requirements from, from member states in a way that really captures what we are offering to the citizens or to the travelers that are entering our, uh, our borders, wherever, wherever they are. Um, I don't want to say that it's easy, rather the opposite. It's a, it's a nightmare. Um, every, time, every time we try to understand the, the number of private charging points that exist in Europe, you basically end up uh, smashing against the wall of, I don't know, because it's it's rather it's rather complex to um, to find. So we need to do something more in that sense. But I do think that uh, maybe extend the whole concept of the right to plug also to the to the public charging infrastructure. I think it it might not be the right uh, um, the right approach simply because let, let's put it this way we have never discussed um, a right to refill we have never discussed a right to gas up as they say in some in some places this is simply because wherever you go in some places more than needed and I guess my my region is a is an example Eugenio might know something about it. It's, uh, it's quite the uh, gas stations are, are present. They are, they are everywhere. The moment in which we're gonna have charging points easily available in a granular manner, we're gonna, we're gonna pass the right to, to, to plug as simply to accept it as something that we simply, we simply have. Of course, just like it happens with every right, the importance is that once you have it, you don't wanna, you don't wanna lose it. And uh, the history and the news are teaching us that this is a very, uh, let's say, contemporary type of uh, type of debate. But I do think that the moment we have a, a public infrastructure which is granular enough, we're gonna definitely get over this type of this type of discussion. Another reaction was related to setting uh, time limits for the for the installations of charging points. And now this is a topic that applies to both the public and the private charging infrastructure. Um, having uh, long and unnecessary delays to requests for the installation of a charging point, once again, public or private, is absurd, unacceptable, counterintuitive. And this is something that precisely goes against the principles that we are trying to um, preach uh, and the targets that we're trying to reach. Unfortunately, setting uh, precise time deadlines might simply not be the best way because the installation of a, of a charging point, uh, once again, either private or public, is not merely an administrative process. Uh, we have all been uh, challenged by administration 
And if you live here in, in Brussels or Belgium, you know what that means. It takes, it takes time. There's a lot of papers that need to go back and forth. But that's not the only thing. There are also technical inspections, once again, safety. There are also uh, um, inspections that are related to the, um, the electrical installation and the safety, but most importantly, the performance of the electrical installation. I saw that there was also a question or a comment on this point in the, in the chat. Um, not, not so long ago, actually, just at the beginning of this year, we did, a, we did a study on our projections for immobility in Europe. And we saw that uh, the increase of um, electric vehicles is going to have uh, an impact on the uh, transformer utilization in terms of their base load and in terms of their, uh, of their peak load. Uh, somewhere going up to 107% of the um, transformer utilization because of electric vehicles. There are technical solutions that can solve this, uh, these issues. And for example, smart charging is uh, one of them. So very positive to have uh, newly built and refurbished charging points having smart charging capabilities, but there are some limitations or somehow some delays that are part of uh, basically electrical grid, which for more than a half of it is more than 40 years old at the moment in Europe. So it was definitely not built for, uh, for electric vehicles. It was definitely not, uh, not built for uh, an increase in uh, electricity demand that we're going to have in the next, uh, in the next year. 1.8% yearly increase of final electricity demand until 20, 2030. So uh, let's, uh, let's not forget that there are also some, some technical steps that we need to walk together. So the right to plug somehow makes sense only if it's done in a way that is uh, pragmatic, that then can lead to actual and feasible somehow, somehow solutions. And so the involvement of uh, tenants, yes. The involvement of owners, yes. The involvement of uh, businesses that might want to set up a charging point because they see the business case for attracting more customers or increasing the inherent quality of the service that they are offering, yes, but let's not forget also those that are managing the distribution grid to make sure that all those promises can be ultimately delivered. Thank you, Michelangelo, for that comment. Uh, I, I see that our minds are just super connected because I was actually about to ask you this question and so you've answered all of it already, so that's great. Uh, I, I think we're quite aligned here in the sense that uh, we agree that we should speed things up and have a stronger right to plug, but we should also like take into consideration the reality on the ground and uh, take into consideration installers and uh, the work that's needed on the grid um, and not have a precise uh, set, a precise timeline because it's a, it's a one size fits all that doesn't always work. Uh, as you said, there are some part of the of the continent that has a very old grid. so important to take that into consideration. Also, uh, take, I also like your point on better planning and reporting, uh, the link between AFIR and EPBD. I think that's essential that member states uh, plan better, both private and public uh, charging infrastructure, and that there is this stronger link and that they install charging point where it's needed and when it's needed. So uh, definitely things that I think we all here agree on. Um, do we have? I, if I may just uh, once again jump in, uh, there are some interesting amendments on this uh, on this point from the members of the European Parliament. There are indeed the taking a, a more systemic uh, approach when it comes to the to the distribution and to the electrical to the electrical grid. I think in the long term plans up until to twenty fifty, I believe both the EPP and the SND are mentioning the need for a clear uh check um of the of the electricity distribution distribution grid uh, i mean i can i can bore you to death with uh, with the figures related to the need for investments that we have in this uh, that we have in this in this sense but the additional additional help 
to those uh, DSOs that are really putting uh, putting the hours in this would it be would be definitely definitely appreciated. Point taken. Um, do at this point do we already have maybe some questions from the audience? You have a Q and A uh, button at the the bottom of the Zoom call, so you can just type in your questions and we can answer them. Giving you two three minutes. <laughs> It's, it's actually an interesting issue on the um, one of the questions there is about you know, the check of electrical installation. And I, I mentioned because it's also a question that many of our members have uh, about the need for a full on wall box or can I plug my car into a normal plug? Is it something that is feasible? It's maybe Eugenio knows more than, than me about it, but I, I think it's an, in, an interesting question because there might not always be a need uh, for for a, a wall box also because and i think that's for the the, the future and the next steps um, if we get away from this uh, this uh, image that we all need big batteries and then electric cars with like an 80 kilowatt uh, battery maybe that doesn't make sense for for many people and then charging at a very low speed on a plug that is checked or controlled by an electrician could could make sense Eugenio, do you want do you want to react? No, of course. Uh, I think I, I first have a comment also on what Michelangelo was saying um, on the on the issues that are related to the to the red tape that sometimes we face uh, uh, when it comes to the to the deployment. I I think before I was referring to the fact that we need to work together. Huh? From the side of fire safety, together with uh, uh, the whole uh, EV uh, world, uh, uh, because uh, I think uh, it's by talking that uh, we can uh, achieve two goals. Once, I mean, one is to uh, ensure the deployment uh, of uh, the electric vehicles, but on the other side, uh, also guarantee the fire safety. Because I have the feeling that sometimes when it comes to fire safety, it's sometimes seen. You know, uh, as an additional uh, burden from maybe certain regulators that uh, um, have not regulations up to date, and that sometimes this can create red tape. I think it's also our role, you know, uh, to make sure that we that we have a smooth uh, deployment without adding red tape, but not uh, compromising on important uh, fire safety uh, standards. And uh, I think. Uh, um, on this, of course, we, we need to work together, but we also need, uh, I think there was a reference also from Michelangelo before on uh, the fact that when you try to get data, of, for example, on how many charging points we have, uh, the, 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 sometimes you counter the answer that I don't know. And uh, we have a similar problems when it comes to um, uh, fire accidents uh, and uh, uh, they, their sources, uh, where they come from. And this comes from the fact that we do not have harmonization uh, of data uh, on fire safety. The European Union has developed a first project, which is called the Fire Start project on, on this, but we are very far from uh, having uh, an harmonization of data at European level. And I think we should put push for this. Also, when it comes to the fire uh, uh, that are related to EV recharging points, just simply to have a, to have better information and take uh, you know uh, better decisions uh, when it comes pub, you know informed decisions when it comes to uh, the safety measures of uh, the recharging points. I uh, on the issue, let's say, of uh, electrical installation. Um, I, I think I can agree on uh, uh, the fact that we need. Uh, um, and that's what I was saying before, that we need uh, good checks of the uh, technical installation, of the electrical installation as feed uh, recommends. And I think uh, it's also what uh, one of uh, the questions is about. And uh, maybe with, uh, with fit on this, I think, of course, then if we go into detail uh, on, uh, on, the, on the 
let's say, the more fire safety related measures. This is, um, you have, for example, recommendations from the insurers and the FBA on the re rapid recharging points, you know, and uh, that they should be differentiated from conventional, conventional charging points because of the assets that are associated with direct current. And uh, uh, when it comes to the circuits that are intended to supply an electric vehicle, we need to make sure that they are fit for purpose and that they are suitable for the electric load. Um, and I think also that when, I mean, this, this also comes from the recommendations of uh, FPA that the circuit that should be dedicated to the use of the charges, char the, the, the circuit should, should be dedicated to the use of the charges and not be part of a ring that is mainly used for other purposes. But then, of course, when we talk about uh, then detailed and technical recommendations, this, there are different recommendations around and on this, I think uh, we need a more advanced discussion with all industry on whether all this measure makes sense and how we can ensure a smooth deployment of electric, electric vehicles. Thank you. Mm, thank you. It's, I think it's like definitely what, what you said is like perfectly on point. We need like to see fire safety not as a burden, but as a, an addition to, to our building. So it's definitely something that we should keep in mind when creating our electric circuit, the grid, but also when installing our charging point and thinking our new buildings. I see that we have some questions um, coming in in the chat box. So first one is how fast should uh, should it go? Is EPVD coming in time or too late with the EV evolution? Anybody who wants to first react? Well, again, um, EPBD can set a framework, but it's a, it's a D, it's a directive, not a PBR. Um, so it's, it's also very much related to national context. I think member states have the possibility in the current uh, EPBD framework to, to accelerate. There are some provisions, some exemptions that are being massively used by member states to avoid during renovations to, for example, uh, install pre-cabling or a charging station. Um, now that we, and I could, to be, to be honest, I could maybe understand the, the reluctance at the beginning because there was a very low market share of, of electric vehicles. There's a boom for the last two, three years, and we have now set the, the path straight that in, in, in 13 years' time, we will only be selling electric vehicles. So the, the argument now should be, should be reversed and said, okay, let's prepare as much as we can in this cost-effective places uh, where, where the private investments can be conducted by charge point operators, but also by, by, by companies, by, by all these, these, these places where people stay for an hour or more. Um, and you would drive these investments at a lower cost for, for, for public uh, uh, money for, for uh, you know, authorities' uh, budget than, than you might think it is. Um, it's all about how you drive the investment, right? I think some countries have already set in place this, um, this, this call for tenders that are really well prepared that allow for massive development from private uh, money with support, targeted support in places where you would want as a public authority as a charge point, but where the business case is not totally there yet. Um, but yeah, the, the argument should be reversed and it's not about are we going to have an EPBD 2.0 uh, in, in three or five months time? but more like how do we now press member states to act in these frameworks? Because that's more now of a policy message, but uh, we know that what will come out of the parliament might be ambitious and you would expect it to be at different levels depending on who you are in the uh, political scheme. But you know that when negotiations with the council will, will, will come up, you will have a series of exemptions. You will have a series of, uh, of we can call them loopholes maybe, but. Uh, it, it's 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 what can be done at the framework level, but again, uh, RPBD targets new buildings, so there's a whole lot more to be done in, in existing building in existing uh, surfaces. Yeah, I think uh, you you're saying something right when you say RPBD is a framework, and the member states can apply it uh, in kind of different ways. Um, so I think. In our opinion, at Avery, at least, we um, we think that it comes at the right time in the sense that it's actually creating like stronger ambition rather than the previous one, previous CPBD. So maybe a 
a strengthened uh, framework, let's say, for member states to uh, to apply it. But of course, in the end, it remains in the, in the hand of member states, and we're still in the legislative process where member states will have in the council to uh, to to adopt their position, and it might be far less ambitious uh, than the position of the parliament. That's uh, almost a given, but uh, that's why we kind of have to to push policy wise. Uh, I think we all agree here that. Uh, there's a need for ambitious uh, EPBD to make sure that within member states, they apply it uh, in the right way. Uh, I see that we have other questions. Um, what role should V2X play compared to conventional V1G? Uh, do you support amend? Do you support a mandate? Sorry, how can flexible solutions be supported? Michelangelo, Robin. Um, so, what role? V2G, I think, um, I think the question is not uh, is not related to the technical aspects. I think uh, we are all um, aware of uh, what uh, vehicle to grid or vehicle to everything capabilities are and of the great possibilities that they um, they offer. Um, honestly, uh, no, the no support for a for a mandate of uh, B2X or of uh, bidirectional um, capabilities. Uh, if I remember it correctly, right now there are four vehicles supporting uh, V2X or V2G capabilities. Of course, all the new Volkswagen using the MED platform uh, will be uh, V2G or V2X ready because of the ISO 15118 uh, standard implementation, which is still very patchy, which is still very shady, some might say, and all that. So, I I do think that um, the type of the type of debate that we have had around uh, V2G and V2X, or in general bidirectional charging, is still very much reminiscent of uh, a similar approach that we have usually with the, some other technological innovations, namely. We do understand and praise the value and benefits that they can they can bring, but maybe we leave on the side that the the implementation issues that they might uh, that they might bring. Uh, let me let me be very very clear on on this one. Everything that can help reduce the stress on the uh, electricity grid is welcome. Everything that can help uh, enabling a stronger flexibility proportion in Europe is welcomed. And uh, here, just to, let's say, and I'm looking at, uh, at Robin with this one, everything that can help consumers even to make a little bit of money on the side or to spend less because they are actually providing a service to the grid is more than welcomed. Ultimately, we are speaking of the integration of different uh, sectors. Here we're talking about uh, energy and transport. An integration that also outside of the metaphor literally happened by connecting them with a, with a cable. However, there needs to be a series of preconditions that at the moment are not there for a full-fledged uh, mandate for uh, uh, V2X capabilities on all the, the, char on all the chargers in, uh, in Europe. Robin, did you want to react? To us, it's also a matter of, um, again, the information you provide to people about uh, V2G, V2X. There have been several experiments throughout Europe about you know, rewarding people for charging their uh, vehicle at night. It does not go as far as pure automation and, 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 and you know, rebalancing the grid when, need, when, when needed. But already that, having this uh, smart charging by automation or by consumer choice or you know, uh, uh, nudging consumers into smart charging, that's already a great step forward. And I that already provides saving for, for people. So I'd say that's the most important thing to tackle. Um, Michelangelo pointed out that, that some of the issues with, with V2X and, and the ISO standards coming. To be fair with you, I'm not an expert on the, on the standard itself, but I know that, as Michelangelo said, for the moment, it's a limited option. And from experience, 
betting on a technical solution to solve all the problems uh, has rarely seen being proven to be an effective way to go for it. So I think there's already ways for consumers to have this, this balancing of the grid, um, bring them savings, but also uh, 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 you know, lowering their bills purely and then simply. Uh, and that's something that should be encouraged at a global level. And it should be done now because it could be really implemented fast. Uh, while the V2X, when we know the potential, that's great, but that will take time to, to develop. And um, as it stands right now, the mandate doesn't seem to me as the, the solution to, to balance the grid. Yeah, I think we will agree on this one. Um, V2X should be facilitated, of course, but it's uh, having a mandate is it's too soon in the sense that it's not technically feasible for now. It's still at the stage of... Uh, European project, uh, mostly like they're still looking into uh, developing it. There are not many cars that support it for now. So it's uh, it's also for OEMs to provide the uh, cars that will uh, support V2G in the future. Um, but of course, flexibility is definitely welcome. Uh, V1G is like a first step and V2G will come at some point. When it comes, we also need to have a proper legislative frameworks that allow for V2G to work properly. I'm thinking of the energy taxation directive and the issue of double taxation for V2G, which is one big barrier which will not help consumer in the in the future. So that's uh, things to take into consideration when we we think about uh, V2G. Um, we have a question for Eugenio. So, is there work being done to inform and educate fire safety groups throughout Europe about the loads and safety issues slash risks from EV charging related infrastructure? We see very different reactions from different groups, not exactly a consistent set of understanding. Um, I think uh, it depends also what we mean by fire safety groups. I think the issue of fire safety involves uh, different type of stakeholders. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, it should be about uh, training and having recommendations, first of all, for the ones that uh, have uh, to use the recharging points and electric vehicles, so the users. Um, then there is, I think, the group of uh, uh, another important group, which is the installers of the uh, recharging points. Uh, another important, uh, I think, uh, part is the regulators that have to regulate on uh, the, the fire safety measures of the recharging points. And then, uh, uh, of course, without forgetting also the training of uh, firefighters to put out fires coming from uh, um, electric vehicles or uh, the, the recharging points. And I think there, depending on the second group, there are different initiatives at the uh, local or national level, whether it is coming from the public or from the private sector. Uh, but it's true that uh, it's a new topic and this is not uh, surely enough uh, for the moment. And I think we could maybe think uh, also about this as, a, as an industry uh, and as industry trying to work together, whether we should not be aiming not only to have some guidelines, but also have some, uh, I would say, awareness raising about the topic uh, and uh, uh, do some activities here at European level that, that would have a cascade, cascade effect also at the national and local level on uh, the specific point, how to ensure a good deployment with good safety measures. Thank you. Thank you. We have several comments, but also a question from Pedro Gomez from Police. How do you see the role of energy communities in supporting EPBD? They can be a way to democratize, democratize sorry, access to EVs and charging infrastructure, in particular in more vulnerable, vulnerable households and social housing. We agree. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh... I was looking through it actually now um, because it's a project that uh, some BEO colleagues are, are doing at the moment on energy communities. So I won't be able to say too much, except that we support the, the concept and we know the benefits it could bring uh, uh, to share, be it local solar panel productions, but also lower the cost for, for people, especially in these times where uh, energy is such a, at a high level and would stay at least for electricity for, for, for some time. Uh, so there's great potential there. And um, I mean, Pedro, we can definitely uh, exchange more on, on this this project that some of our colleagues are doing. And I'd be happy to to provide more info then. 
Michelangelo, I see you nodding. Do you want to comment or? No, just to just to say that um, yes, in line with uh, in line with uh, with Robin, uh, just like just like him, I'm not the one taking care of this uh, of this topic internally. However, if we just look at the if we just look at the principles, consumer rights, balancing and flexibility of the grid, uh, supporting uh, the um, basically the e economics of the different uh, of the different consumers um it's something that we cannot we can only we can only support indeed same way <laughs> very much supporting this idea of uh, uh, energy communities uh and supporting epbd so i'm um, happy to discuss uh, in another forum maybe later um i don't see any more question and i say that it's already 3 16 so i think i might give back the floor to uh, our Secretary General, Philippe Andrion. And then first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Robin, Eugenio, and Michelangelo for participating in this panel and uh, exchanging. It was a fruitful debate, I would say. So thank you so much for, for coming. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you all for um, this excellent discussion around EPVD. Um, thank you for sharing your insights. And yeah, let's keep on going the discussion. Um, I think it, we are still have to wait for the outcomes uh, on the final uh, discussions with uh, definitely on the trialogues to, to foresee. Um, so looking forward and let's keep in touch. And this brings me also to the end of um, today's uh, webinar, but kindly also invited to our next um, STEAM events. The next one that we have coming is you for weights. Everything that has to do on heavy duty vehicles decarbonization. This will be a live event at our offices. So please subscribe in time. Um, secure your spot. We have limited spaces. We are going for quantity of attendees and not for quality. Well, for quality and not for quantity. I'm almost mixing up. Um, looking forward to see you there next month, 19th of October. And have a nice weekend. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. You have a good one. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.